Well, good morning, everyone. So you would keep those Bibles out and go ahead and turn back a few chapters to 2 Kings chapter 21 and also the 2 Chronicles 33, if you can. We'll be bouncing around those two chapters uh, here this morning. Uh, but it's good to be out with you guys. I mean, as always, I'm excited to present a lesson from God's Word with you. Uh, next week, Lord willing, Haley and I and Russell, we're going to be down in Florida. And so in my absence, uh, Jacob Brittnell will be presenting the lesson. So I know he'll do a good job with that. So uh, that gives you something to be uh, looking forward to for next Sunday. Uh, but this morning, we're going to talk about uh, someone you may be familiar with, King Manasseh. Uh, but it, even if you have no idea who King Manasseh is, th- consider this, would you? Do you have any friends named Manasseh, right? Any, any cousins named Manasseh? Pro- probably not. Uh, that may not necessarily be all of an indicator, but for the same reason we don't hear a lot of people named Manasseh, we don't hear people named, uh, you know, Jezebel or Ahab, right? Uh, I did know some people that would name their cats after wicked kings, and so they would name them Ahab. I know I just polarized half my audience, half of you are like... <laughs> Sorry, cat people. Uh, but right, Manasseh's in that company of like Jezebel, Ahab, some of the most wicked people that we read about in the Bible. M- Manasseh is right in that company. And rather than me taking my word for it about how wicked he is, let's read about it. Let's get a foundation in front of us and see how the Bible depicts Manasseh. What, what does the narrative say about who this man was? And so I'm going to be actually in 2 Chronicles 33 this morning. That, that's, that will kind of be the one I uh, prefer of 2 Kings account and Chronicles. But we'll be in 2 Chronicles 33. Let's start by reading the first nine verses here. Listen to what it says about him. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began the reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down, and he erected altars to the Baals, and made Asherah, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the courts of the house of the Lord. Verse 6, and he burned his sons as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and used fortune telling and omens and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sign of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the idol that he, ma- that he had made, he set in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will no more remove the foot of Israel from the land that I have appointed for your fathers, if only they will be careful to do all that I have commanded them, all the law, all the statutes, the rules given them through Moses. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. So so right there, right? Nine verses, and it kind of gives you an overview of who Manasseh was. And to say Manasseh was a wicked king, that just feels like an understatement, right? What a corrupt man he was. And I would argue, based on what Scripture reveals for us, that more than any other person, more than any other person, King Manasseh stands out as the primary reason that Judah will have to go into Babylonian captivity. And I know we, we might say that, well, that... It seems kind of tough to pin it on one person. And no, a lot of people have a part to play in the eventual downfall of Judah. But it seems like when you study the, the, the kings, the prophets, in the book of Chronicles, right, Manasseh seems to be the person that pushed Judah over the, to the point of no return. His sins and the consequences of those sins were so wide-reaching. In those passages that I put up, one of those is what uh, uh, Dennis read for us in the Scripture reading this morning, illustrate how even some years into the future, they look back on Manasseh's reign and just how wicked he was, how he provoked the Lord to anger. And as you notice, maybe in verse 1 of what we were just reading, it tells us that he began reigning at 12 years old. And he would reign for 55 years. Years, 55 years. We, we, we get a president we don't like for four years, and we think that's too long. Can you imagine having someone like Manasseh reigning for 55 years? 
the ripple effect of his sin was felt throughout the nation of Judah. And so there is a sense when we talk about Manasseh, then then I think rightfully so, we we have to address, we kind of have to start with this profound wickedness. And allow me to kind of illustrate this in another way. Well, why is Manasseh remembered for being so evil? Well, why is the magnitude of his sin so wide-reaching whenever we talk about him and what the narratives reveal for us? Well, first, consider this, the fact that he came from a godly home. That that just seems to heighten kind of the wickedness that we just read about. If you were paying attention very carefully as I was reading, you might have caught who his father was. Do you remember who his father was? And I know for some of you that have never studied the kings before, this is all just can't keep them straight. That's all right. But his, his father was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is right up there with the likes of David and Josiah. He's one of the righteous kings of Judah. In fact, go back just a couple chapters, the, the Second Chronicles 31. Listen to what it says about Hezekiah. This is Manasseh's dad. Listen to what it says about him. It says, Thus Hezekiah did all, throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God and in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and he pr- and prospered. Right? So, I mean, what, what, what a great guy. I mean, he, he's remembered, like I said, as one of the greats in the kings of Judah, up there with David. He, Hezekiah is king when Judah is, is staggering. They're, they're walking in the darkness. They haven't observed the Passover in years. And he comes about comes about and he restores that. And so then the sin of Manasseh becomes magnified in a sense. When here we have a son who grew up in this home with Hezekiah as his father, and he turns his back on what he was taught and what he learned. Maybe we even see this sometimes today. Someone who perhaps spits in the face of those that taught them those that so deeply tried to implant God's Word in their heart, and yet they wanted nothing to do with it. It's heartbreaking when we see that, and such is the case of Manasseh. But another thing that kind of heightens the sin of Manasseh, and why he is remembered for being so evil, is the fact that God repeatedly warns him. It wasn't that he could just claim in ignorance, right, and that he didn't know better. No, there, there are so many instances where we see that different prophets came during the time of Manasseh. Different people, servants of Yahweh, well, would come and warn him and say, you need to not do that, right? Or Second Chronicles 33 and verse 10, one verse after what we started with. This is, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. They didn't listen. That they ignored what the Lord had said in 2 Chronicles 33, again, looking back in history, kind of summarizing the period of the decline of Judah and Israel, summarizes that idea as well. And so here, here we have this man. Again, he can't claim ignorance for how he acted. He grew up learning about Yahweh, and he repeatedly had warnings and interactions with prophets and from God. But doesn't it say a lot about a person who doesn't heed the warnings? doesn't listen when someone comes to them with, with instruction. Many of you will remember what happened in August, right? 19 years ago, in 2005. Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. One of the most devastating hurricanes our country has ever seen. It made landfall as a Category 5 hurricane. And as that hurricane entered the Gulf, you might remember some of the satellite photos. That was one of the few hurricanes that we've ever had that filled the entire Gulf of Mexico. I mean, that just sends shivers down your back that that thing's coming. And the mayor, for the first time in New Orleans history, had to issue a mandatory evacuation. And the mayor, you you can go back in history, he warns the people and said, this is the storm we've been dreading. This is the one that we hoped would never come. And so these mandatory evacuations went out, and they begged the people, pleaded with them, say, hey, you need to leave. If this gets over those levees, it's a bull. And yet you can look back, and stories can be found of people who said it won't be that bad, and said, we'll wait it out. To this day, 19 years later, we still have no idea how many people died in Hurricane Katrina. Latest estimates are anywhere between 1,200 or as many as 1,800 because so many of the bodies were never even recovered. 
That was the nation's costliest hurricane. It estimated that it cost us $150 billion in damage. It left that city unrecognizable. But again, those people were not without warning. And yet many people do the same thing in an area today that is much more serious than even hurricanes. And people will say, well, what's more serious than a hurricane? Or a tornado or a natural disaster? Some people fail to heed the warnings of Scripture. That judgment stands waiting for them if they don't listen to God. And such is true in the life of Manasseh. He was told. He was told what would happen if you serve these idols and you build them up or you erect them in the house of the Lord. Hezekiah taught this boy, and he did not listen. And eventually God gives Manasseh over the judgment, and that is a reality that he will not be able to run from. Something else that I can't help but think about, what what makes Manasseh so wicked and how oftentimes the Scriptures talk about him, how he's depicted in the prophets and in the kings and historical books, is the fact that he took others with him in his sin. All right, it's not just that he, he, he served as king in isolation and only affected himself. No, again, it's such a wide-reaching effect that he had in his reign as king. Listen to what 2 Kings 21 says about him. Verses 10 through 12, it says, And the Lord said by his servants, the prophets, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all the Amorites did, who were before him and has made Judah also the sin with his idols, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Do you notice verse 11, what it emphasizes about Manasseh there? Did you catch that? It said Manasseh committed these abominations. Manasseh did more evil than the Amorites. Manasseh made Judah the sin with his idols. Right? It's one thing if he made a mess of his own life. The Scripture makes it clear that he affected so many others. He, he led Judah into sin as well. And right, he, he brought his own family down too. He lost his own family. I, I'll spare you showing pictures on the PowerPoint of how horrific the practices were that made mention of him sacrificing his sons. Other people suffered from the consequences and the sins of Manasseh. And so hopefully you can see why he's remembered for being so wicked. But eventually in Manasseh's life, the, warnings, the, the, the warning he heard throughout his reign as king, they come true. It's a reality he, he can't escape from. And go back to 2 Chronicles 33, please. Let, let's read about what happens to Manasseh, because that's not where the story ends. 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 10 We'll read verses 10 and 11. It says, The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. Therefore the Lord brought upon the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. Verse 11 is a terrifying verse. I want you guys to appreciate that. It doesn't go into much detail, uh, but the Assyrians were ruthless. Like, we've been talking about Manasseh, and he's a bad guy. Assyria was not a nation you wanted to mess with. Right? We fast forward today, we, we remember the, the death of Jesus, right? And the Lord's Supper, how he was hung on a cross. And we think about crucifixion. What a cruel way to die. You know who was the first nation that started doing crucifixion? It was the Assyrians. They were masters in torture. And so, verse 11, thankfully, it spares us some of the details about him being bound, uh, you know, captured with hooks and bound him with chains. Don't, mature audiences only, right, if you Google that and you want some pictures. It's disturbing. Just how cruel this is. But notice what comes from this judgment. It caused Manasseh to seek God. Keep reading verse 12. It says, And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. You catch that the first part of verse 12, right? When he was in distress. Let's us know that he's suffering right now. Things are not good for Manasseh. But what does that cause him to do? We, we see God's judgment, God's discipline works for good. It's always just. It's always good. We may not be able to see it. We may struggle to reconcile that. But for Manasseh, this is the first time he really thinks about God. 
And you bet now he's thinking about Yahweh, the true God, the Lord of lords. And so in verse 13, this is what he prays. He prayed to him. Uh, verse 13, he prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. We see that what comes from his judgment when he is suffering at the hands of the Assyrians causes him to pray out, cry out to God. And you know what maybe staggers us most is verse 13 is that that results in God's mercy, that God is moved. God is moved by the prayer of Manasseh, even someone like Manasseh. And immediately that causes Manasseh to, to quickly try and go out and fix the damages that he has done. He, he repents, right? And we see the fruit of that repentance in verses 15 through 17. Listen to what Manasseh does after he realizes that the Lord is God. This is what it says. And he took away the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And he threw them outside of the city. Verse 16, he also restored the altar of the Lord and offered on the sacrifices of peace offerings and of thanksgiving. And he commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Verse 17, nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord, their God. So we see that Manasseh, after recognizing that the Lord is God, that he's been doing so much that is wrong, immediately repents, right? He's trying to undo this damage. He's trying to change it. But for the rest of his time as king, he will face an uphill battle of trying to act faithfully and undoing the damage of all that he had set up in the city of Jerusalem. And so as we close this morning, I want us to finish by pointing out some applications that we can learn from the life of Manasseh. Some applications that are relevant for us as people that are under the new covenant, looking back and studying from those who are under the old covenant. I'm going to give you just three lessons, applications to take home with you this morning. And the first is this, that listen, a godly family is not a guarantee for spiritual success. And I would argue the inverse of that is true as well, right? An ungodly family is not a guarantee for spiritual disaster. And the, the stories of the kings, right? Read Kings, read Chronicles, illustrates this so plainly. Where, where you see how a wicked king is followed by their son being just one of the most righteous kings. Or like in the case of Manasseh, right? He comes from a godly, a righteous father like Hezekiah, and he turns out one of the most rotten of them all. And so you see kind of both sides of that spectrum when we study the kings. And that's where I think it's important for us to remember, though, that, that we don't inherit the sins of our parents, right? Ezekiel 18 is a great chapter that illustrates that, right? The soul that sins shall die. We, we don't inherit the, the, the wickedness from our parents, but the opposite of that is true as well, right? We don't inherit the righteousness of our parents. If only it were that easy. Manasseh teaches us that that's not the case. But what a blessing it is to grow up in a godly home where the Lord is put first in everything. I look out and I know most of your stories, not all of you, but I think I know most of your stories, and some of you come from some really good families, some godly homes where you, know, where, where you see the Bible is read. You have parents that pray with you. When Sunday rolls around, there's no debate on what are we going to do today. Because you know that the Lord, Sunday, the first day of the week, that's the Lord's day. You grew up in that environment, and that, that is a blessing. And for those of you who come from righteous parents and families, don't take that for granted. We kind of hit on this actually a little bit in Bible class this morning, that a godly family is not a guarantee for spiritual success. And I would argue this too, that our families are not the most important relationship either, right? That's not ultimately what it is all about. See, what matters most is not who you are the offspring of. But I'm the offspring of Kyle and Mary. Or someone's the offspring of Rob and Dana or Patrick and Laura, right? Rather, what matters is if we are sons and daughters of who? Of God. And how is that possible? How, how can we ever be sons of God or daughters of God? It's through Jesus. Ephesians 1.5 brings out that language that through love, God predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ. 
See, being found in Christ is the most important family that we can be a part of. But what I I hope to emphasize with this point is that we need to appreciate that following Jesus is a personal decision. It's a personal decision that, that someone has to make on their own. It's not something another person can do for you. Sure, parents should be leading you and should be helping you in that effort. And other people pour into your hearts and your mind throughout the years. But as Philippians 2 and verse 12 teaches us, we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Having godly parents, wow, that's a blessing. It's a great advantage that some people don't have. But at the end of the day, it's not a guarantee. It's a personal decision to follow after Jesus, to choose what is right, and to choose that each and every day. Another lesson that when I study the life of Manasseh that it teaches me is the tragic truth of too little, too late. Guys, Manasseh reigned for 55 years. I'm, I like just turned 31. I can't even imagine being alive 55 years, let alone reigning as king for 55 years. I know those of you who are older are like, hey now, hear me out. 55 years to reign as king leading the people in a certain direction. you know how many consequences that's going to have? That's why I tried to bring out in verses 15 and 16 that after he realizes that the Lord was God, what does he go and do? He tries to go and undo. It's hard to know the exact timeline in the life of Manasseh, right? But we know it's very late in his life that he starts to try and undo everything that he's done, tries to tear down the altars, tries to correct all the wrongs. But again, it... It's kind of too little, too late at that point. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but so much damage has been done. He made quite the mess in his life. You know, there, there's a verse, too, that we didn't read from 2 Kings 21 and verse 16. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to what it says. It says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides the sin that he made you to the sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Right, we've been talking about how wicked he is. The Scripture can only use hyperbole to depict just how wicked he is. That it, that it filled Jerusalem from one end to another with blood. He was bloodthirsty. He was a murderous king. And I bring that out right after pointing out how he tried to make all these changes, tried to undo everything. Don't you think there was a lot of regret that he faced those last few years of his life? Saying, what what did I do? What what have I been practicing? And watching the hearts of the people trying to turn back to Yahweh, but struggling against it. See, brethren, a consistent message in the Bible, both old and new, is this. It's prepare the meat thy God. And most times that phrase is not used as like an encouraging invitation song. It's oftentimes used in a sense of judgment. But I I want us to understand this. Don't get to the point in your life where the consequences of your sin have a devastating effect. See, Manasseh's mess that he gets himself into, it's a lesson for us that our headlong pursuits of sin can result in long-term consequences that, that, that we never even saw coming. And some of you may say, well, how is it a story of too little, too late, right? He repented and he prayed to God. Yes, that, that's, that's true, but we can't ignore the situation even after his repentance. Think about his grandson, right? Manasseh's son, wicked, right? Short-lived reign as king. But his grandson is another name you might be familiar with. It's the man Josiah. And Josiah, again, kind of like you got David's the epitome of a good king. And then underneath that, you got like Hezekiah and Josiah. Maybe Jehoshaphat too, right? I put those three up there. Josiah did so many good reforms, trying to tear down the altars, trying to to help save what he could of Judah. Jeremiah is a contemporary of Josiah, And we see that Jeremiah is actively rebuking the people, and Josiah is a godly king doing what he can to help them. But he ran into a problem. You know what that problem is? Jeremiah 3 and verse 10 reveals it to us. It says, Yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, declares the Lord. See, after Manasseh repented and came back, He tore down the altars, right? And said, hey, you need to serve only the Lord. 
And Josiah comes along a few years later and does the same thing and says, you need to serve only the Lord. But what does Jeremiah 3 and verse 10 reveal? Sure, the, the nation as a whole, they, they followed that. But there was a problem, and it was a heart problem. They were following in form, not in substance. Their heart was far from them. And that lesson stands out for us. That don't wait until later to make changes. The time to repent is always now, not later. Don't delay in doing what is right. The, the biblical response in recognizing sin in my life is, should be urgency. That's how it's typically met in the New Testament. I know, again, Rob, I'm stepping on all your Acts material for class on Sunday morning. But think about the Ethiopian eunuch, right? I'll use one we already covered. Acts chapter 8. After he's been preached, Jesus, what, what happens? See, here, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Repentance and making things with, right with God should never be delayed. But I want to end on a little bit of a happier note. Because there is some good from the life of Manasseh. We can't ignore what Scripture reveals to us, right? Of his wicked and evil life and the consequences of that. That's, there's so many lessons there. But I, something amazing happens to Manasseh that should open our eyes up, not to who Manasseh is, but more importantly to the God we serve. One of the lessons we see is the depths of our God's mercy. Read these verses again. I know we've already read them today, but 2 Chronicles 33, 12 and 13, it says, When he was in distress, being Manasseh, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his father. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Right? Credit where credit's due. Manasseh comes to his senses. He humbles himself. Something a lot of kings don't do. But he humbles himself and he prays to God. But God hears his prayer. And more than that, God is moved by the prayer of even someone like Manasseh. Consider, consider this thought, right? Manasseh, someone who is redeemed, forgiven, and in heaven. How does that, that make you feel? You know, we, we have in our mind, when we get to heaven, I want to talk to Moses, right? We want to talk to these people. What do you do if you get there and it's like, Manasseh? Hey, man. Manasseh found the mercy of God and he tried to do what was right. And so here's a truth from Manasseh's life that we need to come face to face with. And brethren, if Manasseh cannot be forgiven, then neither can I. If Manasseh cannot be forgiven, then neither can I. And this may be hard for us to fathom, to hear at face value, but my sin is no different than his. The magnitude of my sin may not be as far wide-reaching as it was for a king over God's people that had specific instructions. No, but, but my sin is just as damning for me as it was for Manasseh. And I hope that when we read 2 Chronicles 33 and 2 Kings 21, I hope that we are impressed by our God, maybe even shocked by it. Shocked that God is moved by such a man like Manasseh. But it teaches us that God's grace and mercy is a well that goes deeper than we can even begin to comprehend. That Manasseh, thought about putting this as the subtitled lesson, right? He's like the Saul of the Old Testament. It's kind of what he's like. The, the Saul of the Old Testament that even he can find mercy from God. And what an encouragement that should be for sinners like you and me. Praise be God for His great, his rich mercy and grace. And so as we finish up this lesson, we're going to offer the invitation here in just a second. But in preparing for this lesson this week, I couldn't help but think about a New Testament verse, one of the more well-known verses, John 3 16, I think someone also quoted that in Bible class this morning. Where it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. See, God did not send His Son. He didn't send Jesus to this earth out of wrath and anger. He sent Jesus to this earth out of love, out of compassion. 
He sent Jesus because he loved us so much. And John 3 also teaches us that we must believe in Jesus. And belief doesn't mean just faith alone. Faith is coupled with action and obedience and trust. John 3 and verse 3 also says, right before that famous verse in 16, says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful passage. We, think about, we talked this morning about the grace and the mercy that Manasseh experiences, but guys, God's grace and mercy stands available today. That anyone who, who has come to understand who Jesus is and what that means for you, that He died, that you can be forgiven, that you can experience that same grace, that same mercy. The invitation stands ready for you this morning. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. If you're here and ready to give your life to Jesus, the water is ready. We'd be happy to assist you in that. So if you're here and subject to heaven's invitation, we invite you to come in front as we stand and sing the song. Select.